Good morning and welcome. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlanta Council. I want to welcome you to this program on LGBTI foreign policy recommendations for the next administration. Thank you for joining us today for this important event on how the United States can shift gears and adopt a more thoughtful human rights and foreign policy approach, one that defends and supports LGBTI people and advocates for their full social, political, and economic equality. This topic is important to me as an out executive here at the Atlanta Council as a national security expert and to the council itself, we are proud to have our own LGBT advisory council. We believe that these are core democratic values and they reflect our current programming, including what we're proud to say, a recently launched second cohort of our LGBTI and foreign affairs fellowship for rising leaders who represent countries uh, ranging from the United States and its allies and partners in Canada, Colombia, Serbia, Italy, United Kingdom, and Thailand. I wanna give a shout out to our team that's made this possible, Vicente Garcia, who's been a driving force, along with Zach Strauss and Karina Dubois. Thank you for making this work so well at the Atlanta Council. But for our viewers today is also the Transgender Day of Remembrance. It's a day to memorialize those who have disproportionately been the victim of fatal violence especially transgender women of color. It should also be a reminder of how important today's event is for those in the foreign policy and national security community at home and abroad. We're fortunate to be joined by a number of experts who will discuss five key ways in which the United States foreign policy can better support LGBTI inclusion and human rights around the world. Our authors make this case that, they, that these can serve as a roadmap for the incoming Biden-Harris administration. But before I turn it over to Phil Crehan and Chloe Schwinke for an overview of the report, we also will have some remarks from two leaders in Congress who have been champions for the LGBTI community. First, we'll turn to Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, who has spent almost 45 years serving in Congress, first as a representative and then becoming a senator in 2013. We'll also hear from Congresswoman Dina Titus of Nevada, who is currently in her fifth term in the US House of Representatives and is a member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and Homeland Security, as well as the LGBTQ plus Equality Caucus. They have both been champions and allies. Let me turn it over to Senator Markey, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Senator Ed Markey from Massachusetts, and I'm delighted to join you virtually today. And I want to thank the Center for American Progress and the Atlanta Council for their commitment to protecting LGBTI rights abroad and at home. And I commend you for the release of this fantastic report. Five and a half years ago, the White House was lit aglow with the rainbow colors of the pride flag. On that same day, the Supreme Court handed down a landmark ruling in Obergefell versus Hodges, which affirmed the fundamental right to marry for all Americans. In 50 years, LGBTI Americans had gone from being on the blunt end of a police baton at Stonewall to having the right to marry whomever they love. LGBTI diplomats went from living in fear that they would lose their security clearances to heading offices at the State Department. LGBTI soldiers who had faced the terrible choice of either serving the country they loved or being honest about who they were ascended to the top ranks of the Pentagon. We thought that Martin Luther King Jr.'s famed moral arc of the universe would continue to bend toward justice, but President Trump did everything he could to crush it. Trump set out to actively harm LGBTI Americans. He tweeted that openly transgender service members were no longer free to serve in the US military. Administration lawyers then went to work to reinterpret civil rights protections to remove LGBTI persons. The same ideology that drove Trump and his inner circle to erase progress in LGBTI rights domestically extended to foreign affairs. Nowhere was this made clearer than in Secretary of State Pompeo's farcial commission on unalienable rights. From the start, the commission was a false exercise based on the absurd premise that there is a confusion on international human rights norms. To be clear, there is no confusion and there will be no ambiguity in a Biden administration. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
will once again be our guiding star on the inherent rights of all people. What Pompeo calls a proliferation of human rights, we call progress. In 2014, I led the call for President Obama to appoint the first LGBTI envoy at the State Department. He made history in doing so. President Trump mothballed that office. We must resurrect it. And I look forward to welcoming the Biden, the Biden administration's LGBTI special envoy. But we must do more. We must pass my International Human Rights Defense Act and my GLOBE Act, bills which together will make permanent the position of LGBTI special envoy and ensure that the protection of LGBTI rights is implemented throughout our foreign policy and development agencies. I look forward to supporting CAP and the Atlantic Council in their courageous efforts in the years ahead. Together, we can bend the moral arc back towards justice, justice for everyone, not just here in the United States, but all across this world. Thank you all so much for everything that you are doing to advance this cause of justice. Hello, I'm Dina Titus from Nevada's first congressional district right in the heart of Las Vegas. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm sorry we can't do these events together in person, but the global pandemic remains a serious crisis and I guess we'll just have to adjust to the times. Unfortunately, we've seen that coronavirus has had disproportionate impacts on marginalized populations around the globe, including the LGBTQI community. We've seen governments use COVID restrictions to further criminalize and marginalize LGBTQI individuals and communities, and use gender to determine when citizens are allowed to leave their homes for essential services, like shopping for food, this results in harassment by police and arbitrary arrest of trans and gender non-conforming people. We know that restrictions on movement and reduction of public transportation also limit access to HIV treatment and other necessary health services, exacerbating underlying health conditions faced by LGBTQI people, thus resulting in higher mortality rates from the coronavirus. That's why I led a bicameral letter with Senator Markey and 46 of our colleagues to the Department of State and USAID urging them to reaffirm protection of the human rights of LGBTQ people in our international COVID response efforts. Unfortunately, we've had to live through four years of a Trump administration that continuously rolled back efforts to protect human rights, particularly LGBTQI rights, both here at home and abroad. We've got to fight to ensure that our global health responses, our dialogue with foreign governments, and our economic relief efforts are inclusive of LGBTIQ people and are carried out in a non-discriminatory manner. We need to seriously restore U.S. leadership and credibility in advancing the human rights of LGBTQI people around the world. And that's what prompted me to introduce the GLOBE Act with the help of many of you. We saw great strides under the Obama administration, which created a whole of government approach to protecting LGBTQI individuals internationally. And I can't wait to get to work with the next administration, putting those policies and provisions from the GLOBE Act back into practice, appointing a special envoy for the LGBTQI rights at the State Department once again, repealing the global gag rule, ensuring that our foreign assistance and global health programs are inclusive of LGBTQI populations providing access to asylum and refugee programs for LGBTQI people, condemning violence and discrimination against these people, and leading and working once again with our like-minded allies and in multilateral institutions on these issues. I know President-elect Biden shares a commitment to restoring American leadership on global LGBTQI issues and making the world a better place for all marginalized people. And I believe that together we can reaffirm an inclusive human rights policy that brings back our credibility on the world stage. 
So please consider me a friend in Congress. Thank you for all that you do. And I look forward to continuing to work with y'all on these issues. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Markey and Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Titus. We do indeed consider you a friend. It is so important to have leaders like you in Congress today, and we really appreciate what you do for the LGBTI community. We welcome your frankness at this uh, session today. I now wanna turn over the program to our two authors of, uh, two leading authors of today's report, which was published by the Center for American Progress, thanks to our colleagues over there. We have Phil Crehan, who is an independent consultant on social inclusion and economic development, and came to the Atlanta Council many years ago with some of these ideas to mainstream some of this discussion, which I think we have helped to do. Chloe Schwenke, who is the president of the Center for Values International Development. Chloe, Phil, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for joining us today. And after they speak, uh, we'll hand the gavel over to Mark Bromley, the chair of the Council for Global Equality, who's been such a strong voice on these issues, and he will moderate a conversation with just a terrific lineup of panelists. Thank you in advance, all of you, for being with us today. For our audience, if you have questions, comments, we want you in this conversation. Please submit your, for those of you joining us on the Zoom platform, submit your questions in the Q&A chat at the bottom of your screen. For those of you who are following us on our social media platforms, use the hashtag ACLGBTI and send us your comments, your questions, join the conversation. Um, Chloe, over to you. Thank you very much, Damon. Well, we can't say that we weren't warned. Donald Trump began his presidency by advocating an America first worldview. And that's how he proceeded. America turned inward and receded from the global stage, including in the world of international relief and development for the world's most marginalized peoples. Of course, America is not without our own problems of marginalization. We have been reminded of this by the ongoing Black Lives Matter protests and in the rise of feminist demands for the Me Too movement. And I would be remiss as an openly transgender woman to not draw your attention to the fact that today is Transgender Day of Remembrance, when we remember the growing numbers of transgender people here and around the world who are excluded, assaulted, and killed simply for claiming our authentic gender identity. We're now at a precious point in time as we join policy advocates all over this nation in gearing up for the Biden-Harris term ahead. A new administration is soon to begin who are already at home with strong secular moral ideals such as universal human dignity and human rights, gender equality and racial justice. This bodes well for America as we re-engage with the world in the context of international relief and development through the 20 federal agencies tasked with foreign assistance duties. LGBTI people are in relative terms a small demographic and a highly marginalized one. We exercise very little political power, we have little wealth to apply to influence policy outcomes, and we have many vulnerabilities. What power we do have comes from our sense of our own humanity and our unwavering conviction that our human dignity is equal to that of any other person anywhere. It's no small thing. We now, through this set of policy recommendations published by the Center for American Progress, call upon the new Biden-Harris administration to carry this conviction forward as a central message throughout U.S. foreign policy. The United States must quickly demonstrate to the world that it genuinely cares about and is committed to defending and promoting the dignity, rights, and inclusion of LGBT people at home and abroad. Policy to be effective depends on having facts. Facts in turn depend on data. No governments anywhere have assigned a high priority to spending money to gather data about marginalized people. After all, being marginalized means that we don't matter. Without having robust baseline data on the actual lives and experiences of LGBTI people around the world, the US government has had an excuse not to invest significant resources in LGBTI relief and development initiatives. Without the starting point that a baseline provides, how could the government demonstrate any progress or results achieved? Well, that excuse must end now. We must use the data we have and we must augment it with robust qualitative data. We must build from the excellent example from my colleague Susan's FNM Global Barometer of Gay Rights and the FNM Global Barometer of Transgender Rights, both featured in our policy recommendations document. 
Now, about this launch, our policy advocacy report, Transforming U.S. Foreign Policy to Ensure Dignity and Rights for LGBTI People, focuses on five priorities. My colleague Phil and I will quickly summarize these. I will start and then hand over to Phil. First, we have built this set of recommendations on the conviction that the U.S. government must protect and promote the human rights and dignity of LGBTI people everywhere and advance a narrative that affirms the universal nature of human dignity. Yes, this is partly a return to an older paradigm focused on human rights, but this time we are going deeper by calling for both legal and secular moral action to support the dignity, rights, and security of LGBTI people everywhere and their full inclusion in social, economic, and democratic participation. A second key priority that we are advocating for is the use of soft power and for leadership by example. We are urging a principled linkage between diplomacy, defense, and international development, and we are asserting that development needs a seat at the interagency table. We especially call upon the U.S. Agency for International Development to create a comprehensive policy for relief and development investments and activities to meet the needs and aspirations of marginalized LGBTI people everywhere, working closely with civil society partners. I now turn this over to Phil to describe the remaining three key priorities. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Chloe. I'm thrilled to pick up where you left off. Um, so as Chloe mentioned, the US must wake up from this harmful illusion that we come first by alienating our allies and provoking powerful neighbors. The modus operandi of the outgoing administration has been nationalistic, short-sighted, and often driven by the mercurial tweets of a president who revels in chaos. This is untenable. We no longer live in a world that can shut itself off or place itself above others. Things like trade, interconnected economies, and even shared culture do bring us together for common benefit. And the historical role of the US in all of this has been constructive. We are confident that this next administration will once again take seriously this responsibility. Multilateralism allows the US and so many other countries to work together beneficially. And we have already seen an important, and we already have an important seat on many of these tables that can promote, that can better promote the well being of the most marginalized, especially LGBTI people. Our third priority thus focuses on economic development and anti-poverty work as advanced through the multilateral development banks. When we focus on the MDBs, we see significant new pathways to advance the well-being of LGBTI people. Of course, when we talk about discrimination and violence, we'll always talk about issues of human rights. But at the same time, we're also talking about harsh socioeconomic impacts, cycles of poverty, and larger economic losses. Institutions like the World Bank have helped articulate an LGBTI inclusive development agenda, while even the regional development banks are gently testing those waters and seeing how to meaningfully include the community. But with the Biden and Harris administration, we greatly recommend for the US to do more, to be very proactive in this space. Really, we have only scratched the surface of how the development community can combat homophobia, transphobia, and violations against intersex people. Fully leveraging the institutional heft of the economic development community is an ongoing process that can benefit tremendously from a firm LGBTI inclusive US development agenda. At the end of the day, we must remember two things here. First, these institutions are financed with billions upon billions of dollars, yet so little of those resources go to LGBTI people. And second, the US is the largest shareholder in the World Bank and three of the regional development banks and a close second in the fourth regional bank. Switching gears uh, slightly, and of course, given that we're still in the midst of this pandemic, the second priority that we explore is how the Trump administration has tremendously mismanaged COVID-19 through anti-science policies, through attacking the CDC and credible scientists by withdrawing from the World Health Organization, just to name a few. We are now paying that price with the highest confirmed cases as well as deaths around the world. How is this an LGBTI issue? Well, the same way that it is for all socially excluded groups within this pandemic, their vulnerability and marginalization exacts a heavy toll. In some cases, the pandemic has empowered governmental-led crackdowns on LGBTI people. Additionally, and for LGBTI people on the edge of poverty, the economic downturn has already pushed them into a situational poverty. 
And finally, due to pre-existing data gaps on LGBTI people that Chloe just mentioned, their unique needs have been left out of public health strategies, culminating in a double exclusion. So for the next administration to emerge from this health and economic catastrophe, it must respect the role of data and science, which truly underpins strong national and international public health systems. Investing in data collection in order to create evidence-based targeted interventions and inclusive, inclusive health responsive is all very crucial to this. For LGBTI people and due to a, a lack of governmental leadership, we've already seen civil society take the lead by conducting their own research. Of course, generating more data will not be a panacea to the serious and complex ills of 2020, but listening to those groups and investing in more data collection, particularly in this ongoing pandemic, is a necessary part of achieving a healthier, more inclusive world. So one last point before I turn it to Chloe is our final priority. We must rebuild a fair, humane, and workable immigration system. In the past four years, the Trump administration introduced unprecedented levels of cruelty through its administration of U.S. immigration laws. We know this impact has been felt on many, and this absolutely includes LGBTI people, and especially transgender people who have been survivors of physical and sexually motivated violence and even held in inhumane conditions in detention centers, sometimes culminating in their deaths. We'll go more in, in depth in, into this issue in the next section, but what we recommend to the next administrations are four things. We strongly, strongly urge the US to restore and strengthen its refugee resettlement program and meet the needs of LGBTI refugees. Second, to ensure that if LGBTI people are fleeing persecution, that they can assert their right to asylum. Third, to create community-based alternatives to detention. And finally, to provide a pathway to citizenship for undocumented LGBTI immigrants. So on that note, I'll say thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to you, Chloe. Thanks, Phil. America cannot encourage other countries to support the dignity and rights of LGBTI people around the world if it does not model those same actions at home. The beginnings of the Biden-Harris administration offer us a unique chance to change the paradigm by building inclusive development and a foreign policy that treats all persons, even marginalized LGBTI persons, as equal in dignity and human rights. Our policy recommendations will start us along that path. I now would like to pass this along to Mark. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. My name is Mark Bromley and I am the chair of the Council for Global Equality, which is a coalition of human rights and civil rights organizations here in Washington that collectively advocate for US human rights policies and development policies that respond to the unique challenges facing the LGBTI community around the world. Um, and I'm delighted to, to kick us off and, and, and moderate a panel conversation with five additional authors and thought leaders uh, of this report. Um, first, let me say that, uh, as, as you probably know, during a transition period in Washington, um, many human rights and foreign policy organizations are preparing transition priority documents. Um, and they are more important this year than ever because we have fallen so far behind in terms of our human rights leadership, our civil rights leadership at home and abroad. Um, and these, these roadmaps to restoring US integrity and leadership around human rights and foreign policy are just incredibly important. Uh, my own organization, Council for Global Equality, also has some recommendations, uh, particularly focused on staffing and funding levels for each of the foreign affairs agencies uh, for the incoming Biden-Harris administration. Um, and I know most of the other uh, major human rights and foreign policy groups here in Washington have similar recommendations. What I think is important uh, in this paper, in this contribution, um, is it really provides the intellectual framework and some of the historical reference to explain uh, how far we've fallen since some of the efforts in the Obama-Biden administration to, uh, to exert leadership around LGBTI issues and human rights. Um, so it captures that historical perspective um, and helps us understand intellectually uh, 
um, and with some practical recommendations where we need to go in terms of restoring our credibility and moving forward. So I am going to introduce each of our uh, panelists. Uh, please excuse my son who should be in school but is uh, lurking in the background. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our panelists, or rather I would ask them to each introduce themselves to briefly in a lightning round, talk a little bit uh, about their contribution to this report and, and, and to give us their highlights from, from their perspective. Um, and then with that, I will open this up to a conversation. Um, I would ask all of you watching to please submit questions in the Q&A function. We would love to, to get as many of your questions as possible, and we'll try to mix this up and make it a lively conversation for the next half hour. Um, so I think we're gonna kick it off with uh, Jay Gilliam, who will, uh, who will give us sort of a, a brief introduction to his, his portion of the report. Great. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for everyone who is joining uh, online with us today. I'm really excited that we're able to share this report with you and some of the things that we are recommending for the next administration. Uh, my name is Jay Gilliam. I am a Truman National Security Fellow, a past director of the Human Rights Campaign's Global Program, um, and I also worked in the Obama administration at USAID. And in all these roles, I've helped to kind of elevate LGBTI issues globally and how we can support LGBTI people and communities and organizations and movements around the world to make sure that they are getting and advancing equality um, where they live. So I would just say to start this that one, we recognize that the new administration will have lots on its plate come inauguration day and its first few months and year. We know that they must tackle re-engaging with the world to manage this global pandemic, work again with our closest allies and partners to meet other pressing global challenges and show the world that we reject a selfish and nationalistic foreign policy and instead embrace one based on the principles and universal values of human rights, cooperation and development. And we know that this work will help LGBTI communities and other marginalized populations around the world. Yet we also know that these communities can't get the dignity, rights and inclusion that everyone else has without acknowledging that fact and providing guidance on how to make sure that they do get those things. So this is what our report provides. We also understand that our moral, moral legitimacy here in the US and power to lead comes not from being perfect and having solved these issues at home, because if that were the case, we would lose on that front. But our power comes to lead from our belief that here at home, we can do better and are working to be better and that we can spread that hope and our experiences to support others who are working to bend the arc of the universe towards justice. You know, the racial justice protests from the summer, ones that included justice for Black and Latinx transgender women, are just one example of the work still to be done here, but also work that inspired other countries to look inward at their own injustices and inequalities. So there's definitely a strong link towards justice here at home and promoting it abroad. Our house need not be in perfect order before we encourage others to do the same. But we must be humble in that fact, be guided by the belief in the importance of human rights, dignity and inclusion for all, and utilize our resources to support others working to do the same. So these are just some of the ways in which ensuring the dignity and rights for LGBTI people can be viewed as the embodiment of the long tradition in US foreign policy that the next administration has the opportunity to get us back to. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Jay. And just a reminder, please submit your questions and answers in the Q&A box. And I'll now hand it over to Susan Dicklich Nelson. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mark. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Dicklich Nelson. I'm a professor of government here at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I'm also the co-creator of the FNM Global Barometer of Gay Rights and the FNM Global Barometer of Transgender Rights, known as the FNM Global Barometers. Um, my job is really to reiterate the importance of data collection and understanding how important data is and understanding where we are in terms of human rights protection for LGBTI individuals. So I'm gonna be introducing um, the FNM Global Barometers, as I said, which provides a database comparative analysis of how human rights protective or persecuting countries are. 
Um, so if we could have the two slides, um, that would be wonderful. So what I'm, I'm going to show you essentially is where we are uh, with regard to uh, human rights. As you can see on the map, uh, which is color coded, what we do with the FNM Global Barometer for Gay Rights, and this is the FNM uh, GBGR as we call it, we have a scale of zero to 100%, uh, zero, being, zero to 59% being persecuting, D, um, 60 to 69% intolerant, C, resistant, B, tolerant, and A, protecting. And as you can see from this map, um, we have a long way to go to create a human rights protective environment, not only in the United States, which clearly is not a leader in this case, unfortunately, we score a C. And this, again, is based on 2018 uh, data. Um, it is a very uh, depressing situation, especially for individuals living um, in areas that are uh, predominantly red or persecuting. Um, so it's really, really important to say, okay, we might've made some progress in terms of, for example, this summer, um, passing laws that uh, protect employment non-discrimination for sexual orientation and gender identity minorities in the United States, but we still have a long way to go ourselves. And we still have a long way to go in order to be a leader uh, in terms of human rights around the world, especially for LGBTI individuals. Um, so essentially, we are in a situation where 62% of countries have received an F on the GBGR in 2018, 62% and only 10% of countries have received an A on the GBGR. So the world mean score for the GBGR is 47.7%. And I encourage you to look at the FNM Global Barometers website to see what our methodology is. We focus on 27 items for the GBGR and 15 items for the GBTR. And if we can move to the GBTR map, please. Um, as you can see, the situation for transgender individuals worldwide is even more worse, um, even more worse, is worse <laughs> than the GBGR. Um, it's no laughing matter really when you look at the fact that um, the majority of countries uh, in the world are persecuting towards transgender individuals. In fact, 76% of countries scored an F on the GBTR. We use the same methodology in terms of zero to 100%, A to F, uh, persecuting or, or uh, protecting. Only 3% of countries score an A on the GBTR and if you look at the color coding, you can see that the United States um, actually scores an F. That might be really surprising to a lot of people. Um, it's certainly eye-opening um, to many, I hope, to see that in 2017, based on this data, that the uh, United States has a long way to go to be more protecting of its transgender individuals. So in short, I wanna reiterate the importance of data collection and supporting the, this, the data collection focused on LGBTI individuals and understanding that we do in fact have a long way to go before we create uh, a, a country, our own country and the world to be more human rights protective towards uh, LGBTI individuals. Mark? Thanks so much, Susan. and. It's just incredibly important today on Transgender Day of Remembrance that we are talking about how we as a country go from an F to an A, which is clearly what we need to do in the next four years. With that, I'd like to hand it next to Carrie Jo Ford Lynn, who will discuss her contributions to the report. Carrie Jo. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and good day, everyone, uh, those of us joining from across the world. Uh, my name is Carrie Jo Ford Lynn. My pronouns are she and her. And I've been working in international development for over 20 years and most recently um, in the LGBTI global human rights space. And one of the things that you know, I reflect on is in 2015, when the US was experiencing extreme jubilation over the Supreme Court decision around same-sex marriage. Uh, if anyone had asked where we'd be in five years, I don't think anyone would have gotten this answer right. Um, 2020 is and has been a year of reckoning. It's been a year of recognizing um, with clarity, with clear vision, what the challenges are that are facing us both domestically and across the world. Um, not only in relation to LGBTI human rights and rolling those back, but also as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic and the issues of racial justice that have uh, been systemic in many of our societies across the world. Uh, I think what's important though, is to recognize that over the last four years, you know, the many policies that have been rolled back related to LGBTI uh, rights and, and human rights and dignity 
uh, we would have needed a longer conversation today, if not for many of the career staff who have held the line in many of the government agencies uh, with respect to LGBTI work. Uh, they have built, created, um, strengthened, and essentially protected many of the partnerships and many of the policies that were created under the 2011 presidential memo from the Obama-Biden administration. And it's important to recognize that. However, one of the things that the paper that was written recently um, recognizes is that because of the recent Trump administration, you know, rolling back the policies, etc., uh, we have had a lack of visibility around uh, the the impact that this work has achieved across the world. We have undisclosed impact. Uh, we have undisclosed impact primarily to protect the uh, the security, safety, and confidentiality of our uh, LGBTI partners across the globe. They've also experienced extremely low funding levels, especially in relation to our partners um, across the world, our bilateral government partners. Um, and so one of the things that's really important to highlight is that it's important for all funding uh, from you know, the US government to be inclusive of LGBTI populations. Um, and that includes uh, you know, funding related to health, related to poverty, and to ensure that this funding reaches especially our lesbian, transgender, and intersex populations. Um, one of the things that we have seen over the last few months is that LGBTI uh, communities, especially those people of color, are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And it's important to make sure that we have not just more funding, but better funding. And this does not just, um, you know, kind of is not limited to the amount of money in a budget, but also the way that the LGBTI portfolios are resourced in agencies. And that includes better staffing, more staffing, um, embedded staffing, and uh, making sure that resources from, you know, the State Department and USAID are increased significantly to the level that, you know, is, is commensurate with the values that we aim to live up to. And so, you know, with these, you know, it's also important to recognize uh, and reiterate the importance of the data collection, disaggregating data so that we can uh, also be transparent about that data and funding levels in uh, documents like the Global Philanthropy Projects Re Global Resources Report. Um, it's important for us in terms of our own accountability to the LGBTI populations, both at home and abroad. And so uh, I'm very, very pleased to be on this amazing panel with these co-authors. Uh, over to you, Mark. Thanks, Carrie Jo. And um, I do appreciate your, your shout out to, to some of the really terrific uh, civil servants and, and foreign affairs officers around the world who have tried to keep uh, some of our programs and, and some of our uh, work on these issues alive. And, and we really need to uh, recognize their work over the last four years and um, support them in a new way with new funding and new political leadership going forward. I'd now like to turn it over to Shrita Gruberg, who's going to talk about the area where we've clearly just fallen the furthest behind, um, our immigration and refugee policies that are truly just indefensible at this current moment. Thanks so much, Mark, and uh, thank you to my co-authors and as well as the Atlantic Council for holding this fantastic event and giving us the opportunity to share our report. Um, as Mark said, my section was covering um, the really horrific attacks on our immigration, refugee, and asylum systems by this administration. The Migration Policy Institute estimates that the Trump administration has enacted over 400 anti-immigrant policies. These policies not only offend our conscience, but are by and large illegal actions that are seeking to undermine our own laws and policies. Uh, just yesterday, a federal court stuck, struck down one of the latest assaults on asylum, a cruel expansion of bars to asylum eligibility that would have blocked people either convicted of low level misdemeanors or even simply charged with a crime from being eligible for life-saving protections. And from what we know about criminalization of LGBTQ people internationally, this, um, would have almost certainly had a disproportionate impact on LGBTQ people seeking protection. In addition to tearing children apart from their parents, this administration has decimated our life-saving refugee resettlement program, blocked asylum seekers from entering the country, and when they enter, severely eroded their ability to seek asylum and protection. And 
even going so far as to require people seeking asylum to first uh, present a claim in countries that also persecute LGBTQ people to even be eligible for seeking asylum once they reach the US. Um, one of the things that the next administration absolutely must do is undo every single one of these attacks on our uh, immigration system, particularly our refugee and asylum program. Seeking asylum is legal, both under international law and under US law. And this next administration must tear down the insurmountable barriers that the Trump administration erected. Additionally, we found that two factors have the most important impact on case outcomes, not being detained and having access to counsel. Uh, the next administration must ensure that uh, asylum seekers have their best shot of uh, securing protection on the merits of their case and not risk having their case, losing their cases and being deported to their deaths because of factors that have nothing to do with the merits of their claim. As my uh, great colleagues have repeatedly uh, stressed, data collection is so critical, particularly in our refugee and asylum programs. The US government needs to collect voluntary sexual orientation and gender identity data to assess the responsiveness of our refugee resettlement program to the needs of LGBTQ refugees, and also in our asylum program to ensure that LGBTQ asylum seekers are not being uh, discriminated against or disproportionately impacted by our policies. Furthermore, the GLOBE Act, which was introduced by our opening speakers, uh, Senator Markey and Representative Titus, would eliminate the arbitrary one-year filing deadline that we found disproportionately impacts LGBTQ people's access to asylum. This administration has detained record numbers of people and ignored basic safeguards for their health and safety. The result has been tragic. On today, the Transgender Day of Remembrance, I remember Roxana Hernandez and Joanna Medina Leon. These two powerful women overcame so much adversity and trauma to find their way to the United States and seek protection. Unfortunately, we have failed them miserably. These two women should be alive today in their new homes and thriving, but instead they died in our government custody from preventable reasons. Um, in addition to dying from preventable causes, the really tremendous work of the Transgender Law Center has uncovered horrific abuses that our government inflicted upon these women when they came here for safety and protection. This cannot continue. Unfortunately, their experience is not unique in our detention system. We analyzed ICE's own data and found that LGBTQ people are 97 times more likely to be sexually abused in US immigration detention than the general population. And that solitary confinement, which can constitute torture, is widespread and the norm, particularly for transgender people in detention. The, de de the Department of Homeland Security has proven time and again, they are incapable and unwilling to safely house LGBTQ people. There must be a presumption of release because the current presumption of detention has risked and endangered too many lives. We need to establish community-based alternatives that are aware, com culturally competent for working with LGBTQ immigration, um, immigrants and asylum seekers. We can't just shackle people to ankle monitors in lieu of detention. We also need to restore uh, pathways to citizenship and um, access to green cards and other protections. Hundreds of thousands of LGBTQ people are living in the US without status. We must restore DACA fully eliminate and eliminate the public charge wealth test that this administration has uh, enacted that disproportionately impacts access to green cards for LGBTQ immigrants. We must also expand temporary protected status to ensure that people who have sought protection in the US from natural disasters um, and other uh, conditions that have made it impossible for them to safely return home have the protection that they need in our borders. Uh, the next administration must also work with Congress to ensure a uh, comprehensive immigration reform and a path to citizenship for folks in this country. And with that, I turn it back over to Mark. Thank you, Sharita. And, and, and that's a, a tough story to tell. And, you know, of the, of the many, many cruelties of this administration's uh, refugee and immigration uh, policies, the one that strikes me as perhaps the most ironic and you mentioned it, is that we are now returning asylum seekers to countries in Central America, asking them to claim asylum in those Central American countries where our own human rights reports clearly state that the countries are not safe for LGBTI individuals. 
it's just cruel. It's just cruel. Um, thank you for that. And, and we'll come back to some of these points in the conversation. I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Kaminsky, who will talk a little bit about our multilateral engagement. Ryan. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I'm a security fellow with the Truman National Security Project, and my pronouns are he, his, him. Um, thank you to Senator Ed Markey, Congresswoman Titus, the Atlanta Council, Center for American Progress, and of course, the Council for uh, Global Equality and all the co-authors uh, with us today. Um, before I begin, I also wanna give a quick shout out to Dr. Ryan Thorison, who is a clinical lecturer and the Covert Lowenstein Fellow in International Human Rights at Yale Law, um, who couldn't be with us um, today, but we're so glad to have him as a co-author. Um, I'm gonna be very brief because I'm eager to get to the Q&A portion of today's discussion. So I'm only gonna cover um, three points, but I hope you'll look at um, the report. And all of these points fall under the umbrella statement that the US needs an intentionally bold and transformative agenda to support LGBTI people around the world. And I also just wanna say, this was one area, our multilateral engagement and um, engagement in international fora, where um, the authors actually kind of struggled to keep up with the kind of conveyor belt of problematic initiatives coming out of the administration and action, actions taken, including um, some developments um, just this week and in the last few months. So um, we did our best to keep up and I, hopefully um, the incoming administration can work to address some of these is issues. First, first point, um, during the Trump administration, the US hasn't been in the room on LGBTI human rights and this really needs to change. This of course includes the US withdrawal from the UN Human Rights Council in 2018. Despite, despite the council's flaws, the UNHRC is the world's only intergovernmental human rights body operating at the, global at the global level. And it's critical to advancing LGBTI human rights standards and calling out violations when these occur. When the US is out of the room, it doesn't get to um, participate in discussions on ending so-called conversion therapy. It doesn't get to, it, um, it um, also um, didn't sign a joint statement concerning uh, human rights abuses against LGBTI people in Chechnya. It could have done so even as a non-council member, but didn't do so. And also didn't get, to, didn't get to cast its vote to renew the mandate of the UN independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity, kind of like the UN's watchdog for LGBTI human rights globally. When the US speaks and votes, other countries listen, and when it's not in the room, other countries notice as well. The US has also advocated its leadership, leadership position in uh, UN human rights treaty bodies. These are committees of experts that work to implement uh, human rights treaties around the world. And the paper calls for the restoration of US uh, leadership and nominating Americans to serve on these bodies. And what these bodies do is help interpret international human rights law and ensure that international agreements like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, like the Convention Against Torture are being implemented. And they're critical in advancing decriminalization of same-sex relations, as well as combating conversion therapy and a host of other human rights issues directly relevant to the human rights of LGBTI people. And while the Trump administration has launched a global decriminalization initiative related to same-sex relations, it's, you know, kind of one of the questions is, you know, where's the meat? Um, many people have said there doesn't appear to be a real strategy in place. It's not clear what this means on an institutional basis. And there really needs to um, be benchmarks to, to develop to understand where this initiative is going and really what it means. Second, um, when the US is actually in the room, it shouldn't be a spoiler. Um, the Congresswoman mentioned blanket US opposition to sexual and reproductive sexual and reproductive rights, rights language at the, at the uh, in international fora, including at the UN. This has left the US at odds with its traditional allies and with some very strange bedfellows. Strange bedfellows. This week, for example, the US proposed a series of amendments in the UN Third Committee, kind of like the General Assembly's Human Rights Committee, seeking to weaken resolutions on the human rights of uh, women and girls. Some of these resolutions were so overwhelmingly rejected, only countries including Russia, Syria, and a few others joined the US in supporting these amendments. This wasn't the coalition of the willing, this was a sad, pathetic coalition of the chilling. Last uh, October in 2020, Secretary Pompeo and uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, also launched the Geneva Consensus Declaration, advancing coded language on the family and explicitly rejecting abortion with a rogues gallery of human rights violators and countries that criminalize same-sex relations. Again, traditional US allies around the world, including champions for um, LGBTI equality were nowhere to be found. And I'll conclude um, the point two on the Commission on Unable Rights. This was the commission established by Secretary Pompeo to provide 
on advice on human rights grounded in US founding principles and the principles of the 1948 Declaration on Human Rights. Now, this is a thing that kind of sounds nice when you hear it. Um, if you just hear that you know, kind of phrase, it sounds really good. But in reality, it's been quite destructive. Um, as we heard before, this um, commission um, has been linked to countering the proliferation of rights, kind of the idea that um, we're doing too well on the international human rights regime. Um, the commission's final report uh, kind of invites the U.S. and other countries to pick and choose what human rights they want to follow. And it really is problematic in terms of the universality of human rights, saying that um, issues like national sovereignty, culture, and tradition should also come to the picture, which, again, is really problematic when you're looking at a world where everyone is free and equal, including LGBTI people, in their human rights. Um, the commission also criticizes um, human rights NGOs and UN special rapporteurs as, you know, being too powerful in the international human rights space. And, you know, it's many of these NGOs, NGOs like the Council for Global Equality, Human Rights Watch, Outright International, and others that are working on the front lines to advance LGBTI equality and call out violations when they occur. So it's really bizarre to see the commission calling out NGOs and UN special rapporteurs and independent experts for being too powerful. Um, the commission wasn't supposed to actually impact U.S. policy, but at the latest U.N. General Assembly launch, um, the U.S. led a joint statement of countries that kind of indirectly referenced the commission's report. Uh, once again here, um, the band of countries joining this joint statement really wasn't traditional U.S. allies and partners. It included 19 countries were being gay as a crime, 11 countries rated not free by Freedom House, and two countries called flagrant human rights ab abusers by the commission itself. My third and last point, the incoming administration not only needs to be in the room, it needs to use a strategic approach. Unfortunately, just going back to zero, just reversing everything won't be enough. We have to adopt a strategic approach. My co-authors and um, speakers before me have already discussed the need to pass the GLOBE Act, which would codify an institutional strategy for advancing the human rights of LGBTI uh, people in U.S. foreign policy, including, once again, data collection in this regard. We also need to use every tool in the U.S. diplomatic toolbox to support and consult with LGBTI human rights defenders globally. And also the U.S. need to ramp, ramp up its engagement with the U.N. LGBTI core group um, going far beyond its current level. And of course, the U.S. should also fill the position of the special envoy of human rights for LGBTI persons, not leaving that role functionally vacant as it is now. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Mark. Thanks, Ryan. And, and I think uh, you had a lot to cover. I think many of us sitting here in Washington don't necessarily realize how far this administration has gone to undermine the recognition of LGBTI concerns as human rights uh, and to undermine uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights at the United Nations and in other multilateral fora. Um, so there's a lot to, to work on there. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, we have some terrific questions in the chat box. Um, I'm going to try to direct a couple questions really quickly and then we'll do a final round. Um, so if everyone could, could try to be concise. The first question was about gender-based violence and, and I do think we need to, um, to address that a bit more right now. Um, the, the question was what, are, what should be the priorities of the new Biden-Harris administration in addressing gender-based violence? Um, and on Transgender Day of Remembrance, we, we should particularly address transgender violence. Um, and I'd like to uh, maybe ask uh, Chloe, if she's still there, if she could briefly address that, um, as well as Sharita, I, just because the, the statistics on gender-based violence in immigration detention are, are really horrific, and I think we need to emphasize that. Chloe, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Quickly? Absolutely. This is an issue that I've worked on for a long time and um, for cisgender women, for transgender women, for yeah, some men too have, are, are victims of gender-based violence. Uh, it's got to stop. I mean, one of the most important things for us to realize is the level of, of how critical this is. This is a, a pandemic in its own, in its own right. Um, it's, it's been going on for way too long. There's no excuse for it not to be stopped right now. It's particularly egregious in the case of transgender women who get misgendered, who's, who's you know, basically the reports against them don't even get recognized. Uh, that's just not acceptable. We've got to be able to call it out for what it is. Last but not least, we've got to get men involved. Men have to be part of the solution. This is not a women's issue. This is a human issue. Men and male engagement has to be central to really confronting gender-based violence. And, and really quickly, um, yeah, I mean, DHS cannot safely house trans women. They have proven this time and time again. Um, 
And the thing about immigration detention is it's not in most cases required. There's ways to get around um, putting folks in there. And so because of that, simply improving the cage people are in are not going to address the astronomical levels of sexual violence against LGBTQ folks in detention. We must release them from detention and release them into community-based alternatives that can provide the support that they need because these are also folks that experience violence and trauma throughout their route to the U.S. And so we need to be providing assistance to ensure that they have the best possible shot of um, succeeding in their new home and succeeding in their cases. Great. Thank you, Sharita. And there were a couple of questions I'll try to group together and maybe ask uh, Kerry Jo and, and Jay, you, you spoke about the importance of the United States leading by example. Um, and, and one of those examples should be uh, celebrating the diversity of our country. There have been several uh, questions about the lack of diversity at the State Department in our foreign affairs agencies. Uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, there are only three uh, African-American US ambassadors serving abroad at the moment. Um, there is a clear problem at the State Department, both in terms of LGBTI diversity, uh, racial, ethnic um, diversity. I wonder if you could speak to that um, and, and really, again, the, the power of leadership as you both discussed. Carrie Jo? Thanks, Mark. Um, and, and that's true. The representation and diversity is, is, is lacking. Uh, I believe we've had uh, gay, white, male ambassadors, but we have not had an openly lesbian or transgender um, ambassador. I think that the power of diplomacy, it sends a very strong message to our allies, um, especially in those countries that Susan would describe as persecuting. Um, and so I think that that is critical, as well as ensuring that um, the support for our diplomatic uh, community is there uh, by providing specific guidance through missions and embassies about how to engage with local LGBT BTI partners on the ground um, in all their di beautiful diversity. I'll pass it on to Jay. Sure, yes, I agree with everything that Carrie Jo just said and would add that um, there's lots of organizations that are working to bring more diversity into the Foreign Service. Um, and that, that includes LGBTI diversity and, and persons of color and elevating them into leadership roles. And so part of the work of the new administration and that they've already signaled is that they want um, our foreign diplomatic community um, to look like America and that they've already been signaling that that is going to be a priority. And so I'm really excited by that. And there are already a number of organizations that um, have some leaders in the pipeline um, to really elevate and, and make sure that that is a reality. Thank you, Jay. Our time is limited. So maybe I'd like to ask a final question, but, but I'll start with Susan because this was posed to you. Um, there was a question about how do we go uh, uh, on the two barometers you presented, how do we go from failing grades to an A? Um, so I'd like you to kick us off with that, but I'd actually like to pose that to everyone as a closing question. How does this new administration coming in in January, how do we go from failing grades in the Trump administration to an A? Um, start well, off with Susan and then Ryan, because I know you haven't uh, spoken yet, and then I'll, I'll go to the others as sort of uh, a closing question. Thanks, Mark. I would say the first step is just to recognize that uh, gay rights, transgender rights are human rights and start applying the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to all human beings and recognize that um, LGBTI individuals have and should have the same rights as everybody else. So in terms of going from persecuting to protecting, it's very simple as we have 27 items on the GBGR. If you get a zero, that means that you are not protecting of that particular item. If you get a one, that means you're protecting. So start protecting those particular rights. Do you're a de facto socioeconomic societal level persecution and you'll move from persecuting to protecting. Thank you, Susan. Ryan? I would just say, you know, very quickly, um, pri prioritize um, passage of the GLOBE Act and the Equality Act, um, leading by example would be very important. And just broadly, uh, make sure our allies, partners and champions for LGBTA allies around the world, including uh, countries, civil society, businesses and others know that um, the US is back and it's working hard in this space. Fantastic. Uh, then maybe Jay, Kerry Jo and Sharita will we'll go to you next in that order. Thanks. Sure. 
Well, when we work to fulfill equal rights here in the U.S., it definitely makes our moral leadership and power and authority that much stronger as we encourage other countries and communities to join us on that journey to bring dignity, rights, and access um, to LGBTI people everywhere. And so I think we need to keep at the top of mind that um, although we're not perfect in this, um, and although others have been doing it, there is power that we can bring in and convening folks and bringing resources to bear to support uh, LGBTI communities and people everywhere. I'll say quickly, authentic engagement and partnership with LGBTI civil society organizations, listening to the people who are most affected and, uh, and acting on their priorities. Really quick, we need legal equality and lived equality. Uh, legal equality, as uh, my colleague said, we are pushing some really important legislation uh, for Congress to enact. But in the meantime, there's so much that the administration can do through its enforcement of existing laws, as well as through funding and resourcing protections and ensuring um, that they uh, face head on the disparities that our community faces both here and abroad. Thanks, Sharita. And uh, Chloe and Phil, if you're still there, I'll, I'll turn that last question over to both of you and then I'll close this out. Thank you. Um, real quickly, when Frank Mugisha, the head of Sexual Minorities Uganda, visited USA uh, several years ago in the Obama administration, I was, I was with him when we went and met with the Deputy Administrator, Don Steinberg. And Don looked at Frank after hearing from him about what was going on in Uganda, and we, behind him was the American flag, and he said, Frank, if it helps you, we will wrap that flag around you. And that kind of commitment, unqualified, is what we need right now. We need solidarity. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and I can jump in on that point. Um, you know, a few of us have already mentioned we really need to wake up with humility before we can even begin to try to engage the world again. Um, and in so doing, this is a perfect moment to see such great work that's going on from civil society, from other stakeholders in the LGBTI space in so many parts of the world, from Caribbean to Latin America, Africa, Europe, Asia, there's just fantastic stuff that's going on in this space that we can really learn from in terms of rebuilding um, our credibility at home and how to re-engage um, in a humble way. I would say that's the, what's immediately comes to mind. Another thing, and I know that we've all said this uh, throughout all of the parts of our presentations, but data, 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 we really need more data. We really need to see that um, this is a powerful and necessary part of this agenda. There's a ton of qualitative data. The question is how do we generate more quantitative data that does safeguard the rights and protections of the population? How do we do that with the community? Um, it's not enough, I think, to say, I think we've gotten to a point in these conversations where we say, yes, we need data, and then we call it a day. Uh, we need to go past that. We need to say that this is a good time to invest in those da in data collection endeavors because we really need to take seriously that um, data is knowledge and knowledge is quite powerful. So let's, let's work on that, I would say. Thank you, Phil. And thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to uh, Center for American Progress, to Atlantic Council. Um, your report ends by noting that we need to move forward with humility and focus, uh, as you just said, Phil. Um, and I think today on Transgender Day of Remembrance, um, those are good marching orders. We need in this new administration, uh, both those inside government and those of us pushing government from the outside, we all need to lead with, with humility and focus and purpose. Um, there are some tremendous and terrific questions in the chat box. Um, we are all pretty easy to find online or through the Atlantic Council. Please feel free to reach out. I, I know we all are passionate about these issues, this conversation, um, and we really need to keep it going over the next four years. So thank you everyone. Um, and thanks again for joining us this morning.